Hello, everyone. Welcome to Arash's World. We have a very special guest today, Amy Newmark. Welcome to Arash's World. Oh, thanks so much for having me on. So happy to have you on it. And uh, let's just start with a brief introduction of yourself. How would you introduce yourself in any way you see fit? <laughs> uh, I'm the publisher, editor in chief, and author of Chicken Soup for the Soul. So I wear three hats and I have a very high energy level and a mission that keeps driving me forward to keep doing this crazy thing. Yeah, and it's it's such a it's such a recognizable brand. And it's 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 wonderful. I mean, you are looking at happiness and you are providing real life stories uh, um, that um, will resonate with with people. And so why do you think there is why is it so popular? Is my first question here. What would you say? Well, I think if you look at the history of mankind, storytelling has always been everyone's favorite way of ingesting, you know, wisdom and culture and advice and tips for having a happier life. And so that's what we do at Chicken Soup for the Soul. We crowdsource our books, basically. We have thousands of submissions for each book and we only have 101 slots. And we're taking the best stories from regular people who are sharing their milestone moments, you know, the most important parts of their lives and they're passing on the advice that they wish they had had, right? And mm. it's very unselfish of them to share these personal moments, but it leads to very entertaining books where you're being totally entertained reading these stories. And then by the way, you're learning a lot about yourself and getting some great ideas for what you can do for yourself and for your loved ones going forward. And, and we're going to talk in a, in a little bit about happiness itself and again, some of your um, um, uh, findings. And I think I, I love how you, you are approaching it kind of like uh, analytically as well as a scientist, like, you know, looking for, for the common thread, what makes us happy from all those stories. But I think what, there are two things here at play. Um, one of the things is happiness is contagious. Would you agree with that? Oh, totally. I yeah. always say, even if you're having a terrible day and you're really grumpy, plaster a smile on your face. Yes. When you walk into work or a store or any other place you're going with a smile on your face, it instantly changes the dynamic and people will react to you more positively and then that will up your mood. Yeah, exactly. So it's, it's that cycle and it doesn't have to be vicious. We can make that cycle a happy cycle. And um, the second thing I like real life stories is because they inspire because they can be done. And so it's it's uh, something that it's not fiction or fantasy, it's actual real life. And I think a lot of people take heart by, by reading these stories of real people. Yeah, it's really relatable. I mean, sometimes you'll read a self-help book from somebody who has done all kinds of incredible things and you think, well, I couldn't possibly do those things. This, this is just not realistic. But in our case, these are regular people and they're saying, look, this worked for me. And this book that I put together, your ten keys to happy, your, your ten keys to happiness, is eminently doable. Every single story contains something that anybody can do. We all have the tools already to do these things, and a lot of these things are just tweaks in perspective that literally take one second to accomplish. Mm -hmm. So that's what I like about it. And you're right; I'm a pretty analytical person. I was a Wall Street analyst for years. I ran a hedge fund. I approach everything very scientifically, very much into fact-based evidence. Uh -huh. So I take this very practical approach to yeah. the world of self-help. A lot of self-help is very touchy-feely, but mine is just plain, here, do this and this will happen. You know, I love that. Maybe I love I'm too that. practical. I don't know, but, but uh, I feel very confident. Yeah, I, I feel <laughs> confident that what I'm passing on to people they could actually do. Now, we also share uh, the love for languages. You study languages, uh, um, Portuguese and French. I did uh, French and I also mi I minored in psychology, but I find that quite fascinating. That, and so that led you to traveling and exploring other cultures and other people in, in Brazil, for instance? Yeah, and I, I actually took Latin and German in high school also. 
Awesome. I speak German. Perfect. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Latin was always like a bit daunting. I mean, just the, the grammar and stuff. And uh, we had a pretty gruff uh, Latin uh, teacher in high school in Germany when I was growing up. So I chose French where we made pancakes. I was like, this looks like more fun. <laughs> well, I, I thought studying Latin helped me a lot with German because Latin had all those verb declensions. Yeah. And that helped me with German because German had those. But I liked German because I could pronounce it. Like it was much easier as an English speaker, it was much easier to pronounce German properly yes. versus yes. French or Portuguese, where mm. I knew the words, but I don't think my accent was that good. But anyway, yeah, I did I did travel a lot. I think my best semester of college was when I was in Brazil. My college didn't have study abroad but back then, which mm. was so short-sighted yeah. of them. And eventually they added yeah. it into the curriculum. So I had to petition the deans of the faculty to to allow me to go to Brazil for a semester, but they didn't have enough courses for my Portuguese major at school. So I had to go away to get enough course credits to fulfill a major. But that was the best thing I ever did because it taught me to be adventurous, to trust that things would just work out. You know, if I just started doing something, somehow I could muddle through and it would work out. And I traveled all over the poorest parts of Brazil by myself when I was 20. I had you know, my blue eyes, my blonde hair down to my waist. People had never seen anybody who even looked like me. Uh -huh. I mean, yeah. these were people who had never seen a blonde, blue eyed person in their lives. Mm -hmm. I was deep into like, you know, like Indian territory. And um, they thought I must be from Rio. That was their theory. You know, that was <laughs> as far away as they could imagine. But it did teach, it taught me a lot about self reliance and it taught me not to be afraid to try new things. So that was good. And everybody has a story to tell. And it's, it's really like diving into that. And it's not just, again, people be, I mean, I, I, I lived in Mexico for a few years. And it's uh, when I talked to, to, to poor people, and like peasants and so on, I found they were happier than your regular person here in, in North America. And I was quite, quite stunned by that because they did not have much, but they still very generous. They enjoyed life. They would invite you over to their meals and they're not greedy like we find more in uh, or ambitious and uh, that we find more in, in, in Western culture here where we are better off. And I found that quite fascinating because uh, they taught me a lot of things about living and being happy. I was interviewing, I was collecting stories actually from poor people. That was what my thesis was all about. Mm. And here's the question I asked all of them because it helped to immediately get to what were their desires. I would ask them, what would you do if you won the lottery? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that was a really fast track into uh, them telling me their, their innermost desires. And most of them just wanted shelter. They just wanted a house because they lived in shacks. Yeah. You know, so that was yeah. the simple desire that they had, just a tiny little house to shelter them. One of the lines that really impressed me that I like very much in, in your book is that happiness is not a lottery ticket. It's like winning the jackpot. I really like that. And so let's get to your, to your book. So this is okay. your, your 10 keys to happiness, 101 real life uh, stories that will show you how to improve your life. And you have distilled it to 10 key points that lead to happiness. And I'd just like to briefly go over them, but there's some that I'd like to focus more on because I that resonate more with me. But um, yeah, they're, they're all important though. Um, so yeah, let's, let's do a run through of the 10 keys to sure. happiness. All right, the first one, which I think is essential is that you actively practice gratitude. You're aware of your blessings, you count your blessings. Otherwise, I don't think you can be truly happy. The second one, which I think is essential, is you have to learn how to use the power of forgiveness to put the past in the past, which is where it belongs, so that you don't carry it with you into the present. The third is to reach out and help someone, whether that's through you know, a financial contribution or a contribution of your time. But when you help people, it really elevates yourself and it makes you feel that your life is richer. And I don't mean in terms of money, I mean in terms of, you know, happiness. Um, I, my, fourth, my fourth key to happiness would be to have less stuff. As you were saying, people who have less stuff sometimes are happier. So I talk a lot in that chapter about getting rid of your stuff, you know, and, and culling and just living a simpler life. My fifth key to happiness is to think positive. And there's a sub 
a sub theme in there, which is to think confidently. Yeah. And then my sixth, my sixth key is to remember to make yourself a priority and make me time. It's not selfish. It's just plain <laughs> necessary. Seventh is to step outside your comfort zone. And you've had an exciting life and lived a lot of places and I've been around it. Boy, do you feel energized when you step outside your comfort zone and do something yeah. new and scary. Um, my eighth key to happiness is to be yourself. Stop trying to be somebody else. Just be more of you. Embrace what makes you special and do that. My ninth key to happiness is to make sure that you're pursuing your passion. Even if you're not pursuing your passion at your job and it's just a job to make a paycheck, pursue your passion outside of your job then. And then my 10th, and I think this is something we've all been really aware of because of the pandemic, is to get outside in nature. I think everybody just started really appreciating nature i, I mean, love my nature walks ever since right. the pandemic. Like, like i spring. appreciate so much more <laughs> yeah i remember spring and summer of 2020 we were all like fans of nature and everybody was saying do you think the birds are singing more than they used to do you think the trees are flowering more than they used to you know and we all thought that this was the most unusual spring and summer but really it was just what we had been missing all along. Yes, yes. And, I, and you just observe things so much more and just like ducks and, and, and mating that happens with ducks. I was like, oh, I never noticed that. All these years that I take walks, I never focused on that or like raccoons and, and all that. So it's just like wonderful. I think that again, it's huge. All, all of these are hugely important. We could do a, a podcast on each of them to really go into depth. But there's some that I really want to focus on. And the first one, gratitude. I think that's hugely important. Um, I've, I've taken various courses, uh, online courses and so on um, about psychology and the importance of gratitude, having like a gratitude journal or just reminding yourself, counting your blessings as you say. I like your term attitude and attitude with gratitude. So attitude of gratitude. I think that is hugely important. And grateful people are more fun. You say it in your book. I completely right. agree with you. Yeah. So yeah. How, how can we, how can we, become more grateful and really count our blessings? What, what can we do like actively um, to, to get there? So that's the cool thing about gratitude. I would say probably half of us are born with a natural tendency to see what's good in our lives and mm -hmm. be thankful, but half of us are not. Mm -hmm. And there aren't that many personality traits you can add on. But the cool thing is that gratitude is something you can add on to your personality. And it's so simple to do it. So I have some stories in the book from people who were not naturally grateful mm -hmm. and they actually learned how to be grateful. The first story in the book is by Jennifer Quasha who happens to be a friend of mine actually. And she said that she came from a long line of depressed family members. And so she just thought that's how life was supposed to be. But then she had her children and she said, wait a minute, I don't wanna be this way. So she had this little date book that only had enough room in it to write maybe a sentence on each day. So she started writing one sentence in her date book each night before she went to bed. And she just wrote about one good thing that had happened that day that had made her happy. Something like, my husband came home early from work or I was running late and I got a parking space right in front. Mm -hmm. So just doing that caused her then during the days to start looking for that good thing she was gonna write in her date book at night. And it completely changed her attitude. And she turned herself into an optimist mm -hmm. from having been a pessimist. Mm -hmm. And we have other people who write about keeping a gratitude journal and writing down three things a day. I mean, one thing you can do is write down three things a day. You can't repeat any of them. Mm -hmm. You do it for 30 days. And at the end of that time, you have almost a hundred things you're grateful for. And you read that and you go, oh my gosh, my life is pretty good because it, it, yeah. it makes you focus on everything that you have, not those few things that you lack. And it really works. And if you're a religious person and you pray, you can just, instead of praying and asking for things, <laughs> when you're praying, you yeah. can say, thank you. Yes. And say, thank you for what you already have. Yeah. Yeah. And, and a lot of things we don't notice they, and a lot of things we don't appreciate. We do notice, but we don't appreciate. And, and we see it's often when it's taken away where it kind of dawns upon us, like with the pandemic and, and a lot of like social interaction was taken away. We appreciate it so much more. We see it with health, matters of health. And I'm grateful 
being healthy, but once we're sick, we appreciate it so much more. And even like rainy days, and then you have that one day of sunshine, you go, oh my God, it's so important. But why not again, focus on it? Today is a nice day. It's, it's relatively sunny here, so, so, but still I'm, I'm grateful for that. You know, and just like, again, the tiny things, I think that's hugely important. Um, one thing you also uh, mentioned here is forgiveness and let the past be in the past. I fully agree with you on that, but we are still traumatized in many ways, obsessed in many ways with uh, what happened before, even the, the, the failures that we had, or so-called quote-unquote failures, um, that are haunting us. And so how can we turn the page in that sense and really be more mindful, be in the present, be in the, uh, the many opportunities that are in front of us that we don't notice or see because of being dragged down by, by the past in many ways? Right. So there's a story in the book, the first one in the forgiveness chapter. It's by Lynn Sunday. And she was obsessing over her ex-husband. She had been divorced for years, but she kept talking about everything he did to her. She would even talk about him to strangers. And then her best friend said to her, Lynn, you might as well still be married to the guy. You take him with you wherever you go. That was a complete eye-opener for Lynn. Mm -hmm. And I think it'll be an eye opener for our readers. So there's a difference between knowing that something happened and intellectually knowing it and saying, okay, that bad thing happened. That's different from reliving those negative emotions. Yeah. Right? And she was reliving those negative emotions every single day. And she said she realized she had created a prison and then locked herself inside it. And there was no reason for her to relive the negative emotions. Her ex-husband had gone forward with his life and when she said, wait a minute, I'm not going to let him live in my head anymore. I'm going to know that he did those things, but I'm stopping right now on reliving those emotions. She then said she felt buoyant. And I think what happens with the word forgiveness is that people think that forgiveness means that you're saying to that person who did the bad thing, oh, don't worry about it. It's okay. Everything's good. That's not what forgiveness is. Forgiveness means that you are deciding not to relive the negative emotions. Well, I never knew that until a few years ago that that was the definition of forgiveness. But I like to think of a lack of forgiveness as if you're wearing this, this heavy cloak, right? And, yeah. and this cloak is over your shoulders and you have sewn onto this heavy cloak these, these pieces of metal and every piece of metal is a resentment or a disappointment or some hurt that happened to you in the past. So you're trying to walk forward and you're dragging all of this stuff with you. And then if you say, wait a minute, this cloak behind me is covered with all these things from my past. Why am I bringing these with me into my, my present and my future? And so you just shrug off that cloak. You let all of that stuff stay behind you where it's supposed to be. And you walk forward light and free. And people might say, oh, that's so hard to do. But what you do is pick a little hurt or a little resentment to start with. Mm -hmm. Pick just the person who honked their horn at you today when they shouldn't have. Yeah. Start work on that one and build your way up to the big ones that are really driving you crazy. I, I love that. The, uh, the uh, Buddhist uh, um, story comes to mind where this, this uh, um, novice uh, monk goes with this, this other monk. And, and if you know mm -hmm. that one. And so the, and he, the older monk kind of helps a woman mm -hmm. uh, over a puddle. It's like, let me help you and kind of grabs her and helps her. And so the, the other monk, the younger monk is like thinking all this time, the walking is like, he touched a woman. We're not supposed to touch women and so on. And then he, at some point, he, he's just not talking enough, the younger guy. And so the, the older guy notices that something is off and said, well, what happened? It's like, well, you know, I'm a bit bothered by what you did earlier, like uh, half an hour ago when you touched a woman because your teaching says we are not allowed to do that. And he said, well, you know what? I just carried her over the, the puddle and left her there, but you've been carrying her all this way for this <laughs> half an hour. And so um, that really shows us, yes, the resentment is in the past, forgiveness, we have to forgive ourselves and others, but leave it there, right? Leave it there and move on and go on your path. Whatever happened, okay, he was not supposed to touch the woman, he did it, fine. <laughs> Don't carry it with you. I think that is, that is a, a very important lesson. And a lot of it is unconsciously too. So it's like really uh, trying to untangle that, but it is very liberating. Again, it is, it is. And you know, sometimes because we're carrying old stuff, then we overreact to new things that remind us of the old things. Yes, then we have yes. 
like double the reaction that we should have had to something new. We have to be mindful of that and not let past hurts color how we react to something today. Yeah, and it, it, it triggers us. And there's like a, a, a harmless comment and suddenly the other person is exploding on you. It's like, uh, what just happened? You know, but right, exactly. also to be, to be patient with that and realize, okay, this is not personal. I don't have to go on the defensive. This is their own um, preoccupations, worries, resentments, disappointments coming through in different ways. And I, I think that's why we see also a lot of frustration and anger. People are frustrated and angry, but we have to we have to deal with those emotions and um, kind of open up to them and let them go. I think, and forgive ourselves and others, I think hugely important. And one thing also that we've seen is the, the me time, the importance of me time, especially during the pandemic, it came out more, but it, it's, it's always important, not in only during a pandemic. And I like also how you frame the we time. So it's, yes, it's me time, but it's also focusing on your significant others as well where I found uh, a few years ago, I would focus too much on my work and career and uh, neglect the other parts that are so much more important, I would say, so much more important than, uh, uh, than what I was pursuing. I think that's a, that's a very important lesson too for us. Yeah, it's not selfish to create me time mm -hmm. or we time, which could be with your significant other or with your family, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. but you're gonna be better at work, at being a friend, at being a spouse, yeah at everything, if you do carve out some me time every day or every week, I mean, it could be half an hour a day to work out or half an hour a day that you're gonna read without being bothered or five hours a week that you're gonna go horseback riding, but something that you can cling to and know, okay, that special time is coming for me. And there was a great story in the book by a woman named Christine Byron, she worked at a job where she had one of those shared calendars so other people could stick stuff on her calendar. And she was a really good salesperson. So they kept putting sales meetings on her calendar. And she had no me time and no we time for her family. Yeah. And then her mentor said, you need lily pads. And Christine said, what is a lily pad? Well, you know how frogs, like they jump on a yeah. lily pad and then yeah. they just bask in the sun and they relax. Mm -hmm. Her mentor said, put fake appointments, put a fake appointment on your calendar every day. And that's going to be your lily pad. That's your time to stop, relax, breathe, take the sun in. And so she did that and it made her whole business career, you know, way more manageable. Yeah, and CEOs are told to do the same thing, and it's uh, the, the just the, the the carving out that time where you don't do anything. But but I think a lot of us are are obsessed with like time is money, that kind of mentality, and that you think if you're not doing anything, you're wasting time and money. But that's actually the opposite is true. Once you have that, as you're saying, you are open yourself up to more creativity, productivity, energy that is so necessary. Yes. You want to know what I did right before coming on to talk to you? I loved it. I ran out that I'm, we work at home two days a week. So this is a work at home day. I ran out, did a 45 minute bike ride, Ooh, okay. came back, jumped in the shower. And now here I am. But I just, nobody in my office knows I did this. I just snuck mm -hmm. out and got that 45 minute bike ride in. Yeah. Yeah, and again, so important, so important to do that. Um, comfort zone, yes, let's, let's talk about that. That's been something that, um, I, I, I do, uh, as, as, as a coach, health and wellness coach, I think it is hugely important to go and step outside of that comfort zone, because that comfort zone is actually, I think it's, uh, it, it is comfortable, quote unquote, the same way we have comfort food and it's okay. But at the same time, it feels like a prison because you are limiting yourself. You are not uh, growing. Uh, when you are always uh, in the same position, place, and so on. So it's really that mindset, that mentality, growth mentality is so important to you, of stepping outside of it. Yeah, I talk about that. Um, I, have, I have a story of my own in our chapter mm -hmm. about step by yeah. side your comfort zone. And I talk about the fact that um, I, I felt like once I turned 50, I started to just not do as many new things. You know, silly things like, not going to a different grocery store because I didn't know where everything was, you know, not going to a new movie theater because I didn't know where to park. So I said, well, this is ridiculous. I'm going to start doing everything new and different. So I shopped at 10 different grocery stores. You know, we finally went to the new movie place and 
just started doing new things. And then I decided to do something that I found absolutely terrifying. And uh, we went to Oman and yeah. the cool way to get to the resort was yeah. to paraglide in from this thousand foot cliff. And then you paraglided down to the resort, which was on the Persian Gulf. So I somehow thought that paragliding was like a fixed wing thing. And I guess that's really hang gliding. That's how I, oh, okay. Right. And so, yeah. and, but I don't, I mean, I'm supposed to be a word person. I should have realized paragliding meant parachute. And I will never I jump out of a plane. Yeah. I won't jump out of a plane because I'm afraid that the little strings on the parachute won't work. So I get to the top of the cliff and they're putting this harness on me. And I look behind me thinking I'm going to see these fixed wings and there's a parachute lying on the ground. But it was too late to do anything about it. Like oh I was confident. So, and then, oh, then it got worse because then they said the only way it works is if you run off the cliff. So you, in order to fill the parachute with air, you have to run off the cliff and start the downward motion and then the parachute will fill with air. So I had to run off the cliff on faith that the parachute would fill with air and that I would not plummet to my death. And it got worse because they put this helmet on me and I'm like, why do I need a helmet? If I plummet to my death, what good is the helmet except to identify me, you know? Oh but, my God. <laughs> yeah, but I did it and obviously it was fine and yeah. it was actually very, very safe, but it was a, a, just a tourist activity. Um, but I talk about that in the book and then I have 10 more stories from other people talking about how they stepped outside their comfort zone. One woman did something new every single day the year she turned 50, mm -hmm. you know, and uh, and we get a lot of stories at Chicken Soup with Soul from people who have said, I'm going to do 50 new things when I turn 50 or 60 new things when I turn 60 or, or uh, you know, one new thing a week because I turned 40, but they use these milestone birthdays to prompt them to start stepping outside their comfort zones again. And it's so energizing to yes. do so. And it doesn't have to be that extreme, but I, I appreciate that when, when you really push yourself. But sometimes also when we commit to something, let's say like just a, a new course or learning a new instrument or a new language. I, and, and like once you commit yourself, you say, OK, now I, I paid for it. Now I have to going to the gym and you say, now I have to go. But then once you do it, you get to appreciate it and, and like it in many cases. And, and just to be open to that instead of just being stuck in your own little uh, nest or cocoon, I think really like stepping out of that, whether it's small or big, but definitely I think uh, it, it helps us grow and be vibrant and stay alive and learn yeah. new things. Yeah. Yeah, everybody should go to a grocery store you haven't been to before. So Good that you're point. forced to, to look through the aisles and, and find the stuff you normally buy and hopefully be exposed to some stuff that you haven't bought before. And, and for me, it's, it's, it's often like, I like to go to the same restaurant because I know the food is going to be good. I know what I'm going to order. But again, being open to that, okay, you can have that, but you can also explore at the same time. It's not like you're going to lose the other one. You might find something that you like better and then you keep going to the other one. So I think that is definitely important. Um, being yourself is, is, is a bit tough because that is, um, we don't really know, I find. I find it hard to, to define. But one thing I do know, and so in, in, your, in your book, uh, you're mentioning it, is that there's often an inner critic that tells us how we should be. And I think it's really, once you kind of deal with it, silence it in a, in a, in a way, in a gentle way, then um, you can really find what truly resonates with you, what you would like to do, who you really are. Yeah, like there's a woman named Tanya who wrote a story uh, for us that I used in this chapter. And she is a large woman and she used to join gyms. And then because she felt uncomfortable being a large woman, she would stop going to the gym. And she kept doing that. What she really loved was dancing. And she finally just powered through and signed up for Zumba classes and actually oh. stuck to them. And then when the instructor was out and they needed somebody to teach the class, she stepped up to the front of the room and she taught the class and she ended up becoming a certified Zumba instructor. And she's great at it. And I've seen videos of her teaching. She's a wonderful Zumba instructor. And she just decided to move past that uncomfortableness and truly be herself. And she's absolutely delightful. 
Mm -hmm. Yes, yes, absolutely. And, and in many ways, we might be surprised. We say, I never thought that I would be this way or like this or enjoy this. And you don't know until you, you really try it out and just let go of those limitations that are often self-imposed or because of our, again, going back to our previous discussion of the past, when people told us you can't do this or you're not good at this and not to listen to those voices, but move ahead and step out, out outside of your comfort zone. So it's a combination of everything. And what I like also that you mentioned is we don't have to go through all the 10 things to become happier. We, we can focus on one or two but I find a lot of them are also interlinked, right? They're connected too. They are like making me time could be interlinked with, you know, pursuing your passion. I mean, they're, right. they are definitely interlinked. And also, I'm sure that some people will read the book and say, well, wait, what about faith? You don't mention faith. Well, I'm not a religious person and we are a secular publisher. But if you really look at the components of faith, I've really covered all of them in, mm -hmm. these, in these 10 keys to happiness gratitude, forgiveness, um, you know, these, these things are all um, helping somebody else, having less stuff, you know, making do with less, thinking positively, making me time. I mean, pursuing religious, religion really is partly me time, right? Mm -hmm. So many of the aspects of faith or worshiping are really covered already by this book. Mm -hmm, absolutely. And also having faith in yourself. And I think that is something that when people, they say they have faith in themselves, we use that term in, in different ways. And, and I, I think like, again, the, the sentiment, the movement, the result is the same. It's just a different label. Yeah, I think it really yeah. is. Like I have a brother-in-law who's super religious and he doesn't understand how I can function without attending weekly worship services. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, I have everything I need already. I don't need to do that. And I've had other people who really understand chicken soup for the soul. Very, very religious people say to me, Amy, what you're doing is a ministry. Just keep doing what you're doing. You don't need to go to church or temple. You're good the way you are. <laughs> I completely agree. And you revitalized uh, the this series that was already popular, but you kind of also um, have a, a podcast. You also have a crash course on happiness. Let's talk a bit about that, how you've, you've uh, it was successful, but you made it even more successful since you took over in 2008, I believe. 2008, so it's yeah. been 14 years. Uh, when I came in as publisher and editor-in-chief, we actually did it uh, as part of an LBO. We, we LBO'd uh, Chicken Soup for the Soul, my husband and I and a bunch of friends and family members and bank debt. And we, we bought Chicken Soup for the Soul from the founders, Jack Canfield and Mark Victor Hansen. Mm -hmm. And what they had done was remarkable. And I loved this idea of crowdsourcing the books and putting out 101 stories. So we kept doing that, but what I did was I, increased the types of topics that we could do. Oh, good. First of all, just by changing the title, instead of chicken soup for the something soul, which is kind of limiting, oh, I just yeah. have any kind of title that I want. And that allowed us to explore so many new themes. And we've done a, a, a really deliberate outreach to bring in uh, lots of different kinds of contributors. I mean, chicken soup for the soul has always been uh, very committed to diversity in our team members and in our writers, but I've been able, because of the internet, to e increase that diversity even more mm -hmm. so that we have, you know, what happens is in the pages of our books, you meet people who you wouldn't ordinarily meet, mm -hmm. you know, and that promotes much greater understanding throughout the country because we have so many people. We have the LGBTQ community. We have of people of all nationalities, ethnicities, religions, not religions, mm -hmm. just every belief system possible mm -hmm. from very rich people to very poor people. Everybody is mixed together in the pages of our books where we discover what actually unites all of us instead of what divides us. So it's been a really great experience for me. I'm on my 184th book that I've put out since taking um, over. Yes, yeah. I know it's a lot. Yeah. But but we just keep going. I never seem to run out of new topics. Yeah, that's wonderful. So Amy Newmark, you're an author yourself as well. You have um, you have uh, some stories there, but you've also uh, published a few books as well along, along the way. Right? Yeah, I, pu I published a book called Simply Happy, which was really 
a memoir about my life and combined with lessons that I've learned from Chicken Soup for the Soul stories. So it doesn't contain Chicken Soup for the Soul stories, but it contains me talking about how those stories affected me. And it's pretty much um, along the same lines as this book in terms of identifying elements of happiness. Uh, and that's why that book is called Simply Happy. And I think I have 25 chapters in that book. So I get e into even more sub themes uh, for, for becoming a happier person because it's worked for me. Mm -hmm. It has worked so well for me. Uh, I've just learned so much from the Chicken Soup for the Soul stories and I use all of it in my daily life. And you've pursued your passion. Oh, absolutely. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's, yeah. It's, I'm very passionate about this. In fact, my whole team is. We all love what we do. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, again, the book is your 10 keys to happiness, 101 real life stories that will show you how to improve your life. It's part of various books. I think 250 or more books that you have on the, the Chicken Soup for the Soul series, which is a wonderful series exploring again, as you're saying, so many different topics, so many different themes personal stories that uh, we can also relate to that can inspire us that do inspire us in many ways and so and uh, Amy Newmark you're an author editor-in-chief and publisher wearing those three hats really well and thank you so much for being on Arash's World and talking about your experiences as well as your your most recent book. Well thanks Arash it was a pleasure you totally get it and I love your training in psychology it made you a fabulous interviewer. Thank you so much thank you.